but and I know Nassim just had a nice family prayer, but I always like to also pray before I speak. So I'd like to do that right now. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, uh, we continue to dedicate our hearts to you. We continue to honor you and to lift up our, our thoughts and our attentions to you, Lord. You, you're the primary reason we're here, Lord. Um, and, and we want to uh, recognize that. And while there are so many other joyful benefits of, of the worship service and the fellowship that we come together here for, uh, Lord, we truly desire to know you better, to understand your plan for our lives, to understand more about our history and our future. So, Father, um, uh, we just turn our thoughts and our attentions to you right now. We ask that you would just speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't have uh, a visual today. I don't have a PowerPoint, but I do have a kids quiz. So I'd like to get some help with that uh, if I could so that the mics can go around uh, so that you can be heard. Uh, I've got our team here. So now... I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Thanksgiving still and uh, a little of the story in history. So the quiz today comes from the American tradition and history of Thanksgiving. What was the name of the famous Native American who assisted the pilgrims? And I'll give you a multiple choice. Was it Hiawatha, Pocahontas, Squanto, or Sacagawea? Okay, you guys see the hands too. So Andre, you're right there close. Who was it? Squanto. That's correct. It was um, Squanto. By the way, these are all anglicized pronunciations. I realize that there's a more appropriate to Squantum is is what I understand would be the more uh, uh, you know authentic way. So forgive me if I use the more uh, again anglicized ways of saying some of the names. What did the Pilgrims name their colony? Was it the Plymouth Colony, the Hampton Colony? Roanoke or Jamestown? Okay, I see back here, Luca. Jamestown. Not the pilgrims we trace our, our history to of Thanksgiving, but that was an early one. Jamestown was an early one, but that's not the one that we traditionally think of. Um, and that's Gloria. Hi, Gloria. All the way in the back. The Plymouth. Say it again. Plymouth? Plymouth. I know that's what you were trying to say. <laughs> it's the Plymouth Colony in Massachusetts. That's the traditional colony and the traditional pilgrims that we trace uh, uh, our Thanksgiving to. There were other colonies and there were other Thanksgivings even before the Plymouth Colony and the uh, uh, pilgrims there. Uh, but the one that we trace our story to uh, traditionally is the Plymouth Colony and the pilgrims that came there. What was the name? Okay, I'm going to see how many hands shoot up on this. What was the name of the ship that brought the pilgrims? Was it the Santa Maria, the Mayflower, the USS Constitution, or the Arbella? Oh, let's give Ketsia a chance. The Mayflower. I'm sorry, Owen. She had her hand up right up front. And so it is the Mayflower. Very interesting ship. Number four, what country were the pilgrims living in just before they set out for America? Now, they do sail briefly to England, and they are English, but they weren't living in England up until that time. Was it France, Spain, Portugal, or Holland? Okay, Owen. Spain. It was not Spain, but I can understand your, your confusion. Okay, wait, uh, can we have Bailey have a chance? Wait, let, say it in the microphone, Bailey. Holland. It was Holland. Holland, uh, even to this day, is known as a place of, of high levels of tolerance, high levels of, of uh, libertarianism. And so many Christians fled to Holland from around Europe at that time, and the pilgrims had come from Holland. All right, last one. What year is the traditional Thanksgiving celebration traced to? Is it 1492? 1607, 1621, or 1776? All right, Ryan. 1621. He is right. He got it. It's 1621. 1621 is the traditional date for that Thanksgiving celebration. And guys, thank you. That was it. I'm sorry I wasn't able to, to get everyone involved. Just a couple of quick kids quiz questions here to begin with. But I want to share with you something that I find very interesting. I love history. I consider myself 
an amateur historian, there is really good historical evidence that we have that date wrong. Very, very good historical evidence that it was probably 1622, not 1621. And I know you all feel very much more educated right now. You are all thinking how wonderful it is that you've come to church because uh, I'm now saying that 1621 may not be the right day. But you can still say 1621 if you want to be wrong. It's all right. Uh, It's just one of those things, you know, we have quite good documentation of many of these things happening. We know quite a bit of detail about some of these early colonies. There's a lot of other things happening in the world at this time, major things that we don't have as much documentation and journaling and, and, and things like uh, uh, that would give us good historical uh, framework for, but uh, some of these early settlers and pilgrims, we have uh, quite a bit of good documentation. I want to read from Scripture before I I get into more parts of uh, the story today. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12 is is where I'd like to begin. Just a few verses from the Apostle Paul here in the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, and I'm going to begin in verse 12. You can follow along or just listen uh, as I read here from the Bible. And Paul says it this way, So, as those who have been chosen of God, As those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. These beautiful virtues. Uh, Paul says, if you are part of the community that has been chosen by God, these are the things that are going to be a part of your life. Gentleness, patience. Verse 13, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so also should you. But beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Love is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you indeed were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whatever you do, verse 17 here, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to Him, through Him to God the Father. Whatever you do, Paul says, We should do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in a spirit of thanks. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and by the way, this name is fictional. I don't know why. I guess it's probably because there's like 13 Dans in this church. I just chose the name Dan. I was talking to a friend of mine, and I said, hey, Dan, how are you doing? Terrible, he said. The kids are sick. My boss is riding me, and the car wouldn't start this morning. Really? I said, that's too bad. But tell me about your folks. How are they doing? Worse. Dad's out of work and mom's arthritis just kicked in again. Man, I'm sorry to hear that. But tell me about your wife. I hear she got that new job. Oh, sure, she's working, he said. But now I rarely see her and I'm having to cook for myself, which really isn't pleasant. Yeah, I said, I've had your cooking. I know what you mean. Well, how about that new truck you bought? I bet that's sure still fun to drive, isn't it? Yeah, but the payments are killing me. Well, at least the weather's been pretty good. Nah, it's too cold for, cold for me. Well, are you glad the election's finally over? Nah, they put the wrong one in there. Well, how are your friends doing? They're busy. How's your dog? Lazy. Your football team? They're losers. Your house? Drafty. Have you seen any good movies? Have you read any good books? Have you been any good places? Ah, I don't have time for that stuff, Dan said. Well, I said, how's your church? You have time for church these days? Oh, sure, he said, but for some reason the people don't seem to like me there. I see. And finally, one more question. How's your walk with the Lord? Dan looked at me kind of funny and said, fine. Why do you ask? In September of 1620, 102 passengers left the European continent aboard the good ship Mayflower, although she wasn't really a good ship but she was the ship that they were on. Of the passengers, 37 of them were what we would now call pilgrims. 
religious separatists seeking a new world in which to practice their religion, free from the tyranny of Europe's religious autocracy. It was almost a suicidal mission, even by the, 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 the ideas of the day. It would have been considered absolutely foolhardy. In those days, it was never a good idea to cross the Atlantic in a single ship. They had another ship that was with them for a while. It was called the Speedwell. But just as they had left England, it developed a leak and had to return, and the entire ship or the entire trip was delayed. The Mayflower itself was a leaky old channel crossing ship, never designed for transatlantic voyages. It was designed to ferry people across from Europe to France, across the English Channel. And though they had wanted to leave much earlier so as not to arrive in winter, their plans were continually delayed, pushing their departure to possibly the worst possible time ever. Nevertheless, determined and with faith, the pilgrims and other settlers and expeditioners attempted the mission. A private company had invested in the Mayflower uh, group and had financed the voyage, but the new world was not what any of the passengers expected or predicted. Arriving in what is now Plymouth, Massachusetts in early November, after a 65-day sea journey, they were low on food, sick from scurvy, and had almost no shelter. And if I remember the story right, I want to say they waited for a month on the coast of Massachusetts, waiting for the tides and the right landing spot before they would even dare to bring the Mayflower in for fear that she would be wrecked on some unknown reef or rocks. So for almost a month, again, you can check history on this for me, they watched the coast of Massachusetts but never did land. But they did land in early November and were in a desperate and terrible situation. Now the winter, any of you, well, I don't know how bad Connecticut is, but winters in Massachusetts can be much harsh, much harsher than what even most Europeans were accustomed to. And during those bleak months, 45 of the 102 settlers died, including 13 of the 18 adult women. By March of 1621, only 47 of the original 102 colonists were alive. 55 had died, including their leader, John Carver. William Bradford, who was then only 31 years old, became the leader and governor of the fledgling Plymouth colony. Now, it's about this time in March of 1620 or 1621, depending on the date, that Bradford, or no, excuse me, 1621 or 1622, excuse me. Bradford, in despair and grief, went into his makeshift cabin knelt down and prayed in desperation that God would send some sign to the colony that He, God, had not abandoned them. And as the story goes, it was only a few days after he had knelt in that passionate and agonizing prayer that a single Indian, as they were called at the time, a single Indian approached the encampment, stood before the startled settlers, and in broken English said these words, Hello, welcome to America, my name is Samoset. And that is pretty close to verbatim what was spoken at that time. An Indian by the name of Samoset walked into their camp and said, Hello, in King's English, by the way, which I'm not going to attempt to pronounce. He said, welcome to America, which is very early for people to be referring to it as America at that time. And he said, my name is Samoset. Samoset was a friend of Squanto or to Squantum, who had been teaching the northern Indians English. Now, I just, I don't want you to miss this fact. This would be like going to Mars and having an alien walk into your area and start speaking English. Squanto had been taken prisoner uh, about 10 years earlier by an English slave trader and spent most of his teen years in Spain and England where he eventually escaped from slavery. 
He had learned English during that time, but yearned to go back to his home. So in 1618, he got his wish and boarded a trade ship back for America. He returned to find that his tribe, the Patuxet, had been totally wiped out by the European, by the diseases the Europeans had brought from the old world. But he was adopted by the neighboring tribe, and he learned shortly thereafter that more Englishmen had come and sent Samoset to greet them. What do you think the odds are that the Plymouth colony would land in one of the few places in North America where there was a native that spoke English? You want to run the numbers on that? With the help, uh, so uh, Samoset or uh, Squanto learns that some Englishmen had come, and so he sends his friend Samoset to greet them. Now, with the help of Squanto, Samoset, and the chief Sashim of the Wampanoag tribe, Massasoit, which, by the way, that is not his name. That's not how he pronounced his name. It's not even close to what his name was, but that's traditionally what we refer to the chief of the uh, Wampanoag tribe as Massasoit. The colonists learned how to survive in the wilds of New England. Squanto himself seemed to take special pride in helping these poor white Englishmen. He taught them how to plant corn and how to use special fish as a fertilizer. He showed them where the brooks with where the clean, sweet water were. He was their guide. He was their interpreter and ally. He arranged peace treaties between the colonists and the neighboring tribes. Bradford and Squanto became good friends. And Squanto, orphaned from his own family, adopted by another tribe, still felt a keen connection to the pilgrims. He began to look upon Bradford as his, quote, white father from another world. Of Squanto, Bradford himself wrote, In his journal, this is William Bradford himself, he he writes, quote, Squanto continued with us and was our interpreter and was a special instrument sent of God for our good beyond our expectation. He was a special instrument sent of God for our good beyond our expectation. He continues to say, He showed us how to plant corn, where to take the fish and other commodities, guided us to unknown places, and never left us until He died. Squanto, Samoset, and Massasoit, with 90 of their tribe, joined the remaining 43 colonists as they held a feast of thanksgiving in October of 1621 or 22. In one account of the story, Squanto was particularly touched when during the prayer on Thanksgiving Day, he heard Bradford say these words, quote, And we thank you, God, for Squanto, without whom we surely would have perished. In 1622, Squanto became sick. Before he died, Bradford prayed for him, and Squanto said these words to William Bradford, Pray for me that I might go to the Englishman's God in heaven. He died the next morning. Although the history of European colonization in America is marred by mistakes and indiscretions, avarice and the clashing of old world and new world ideals, the story of those 37 pilgrims and their Thanksgiving celebration in harmony and peace with the native tribesmen is a treasure of American history. And I could not be reminded of another story. I couldn't help but be reminded of another story we all know so well. It's our story. Because it was in our darkest hour, when our needs were greatest, when humanities desperately needed a sign of God's love and provision, that a single individual appeared in our midst who had come from a world that we desperately needed to understand. He spoke our language and he was able to to teach us the culture of a new world. He came as our guide and interpreter. He taught us to survive, how to live, how to thrive. He came to make peace with us and became our fast and devoted friend. Jesus Christ is our Squanto. And Squanto was Jesus Christ to those pilgrims. Jesus is the one we can confidently say is a special instrument sent of God 
for our good beyond our expectation. Just as those pilgrims could not have survived without the assistance of Squanto, how can we survive without Jesus? Again, Paul says in Colossians, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. And again, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of our Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. I know many of you know this story and have heard it, but I think it's good to review it and be refreshed from time to time because I think it is a true wonder of God and a great illustration for us today. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we love you today, and we have faced difficult times, maybe not quite as desperate or complicated or deadly as what those pilgrims faced in that bleak time when they first arrived in this world, in the new world. And Lord, the miracles, and there are so many more that we could mention and, and highlight regarding their survival. Many colonies totally disappeared, but somehow they were able to survive, and they, they established a pattern of thanksgiving. And Lord, we see a, a parallel to that moment and to what you want to do for us also. So Father, help us to appreciate the gift that you have given us in Jesus Christ. Help us to take advantage of the guidance and the leadership that Jesus wants to bring into our lives. For truly without it, Lord, we will not survive. We still live in a world fraught with danger and with confusion and with sin and selfishness. Help us to see your plan and help us in whatever we do because of your love for us, have an attitude of thankfulness. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.